Hi everyone, welcome to the MPS Now Lab. My name is Thomas and this is Uriol, and we're applications engineers at the MPS office in Barcelona. So today we're going to be talking about LLC converters. So let's move on to the presentation. Besides Uriol and myself, today we're accompanied by Prasad and Jim, who are field applications engineers for the US, and they will be also available to answer any questions that you may have at the end. So let's have a look at what we're going to talk about in this webinar today. Well, first, we're going to go over the LLC converters applications and the motivation behind using this converter topology. Then we're going to go into understanding the LLC converters basic operation before delving into the specific design constraints that these converters have, such as the gain, the load, the frequency and the inductance. Then we're going to show you a tool that we've developed to help you design your converter and then offer you a live demonstration of how these converters work in the lab. And finally, we're going to have our Q&A session. So LLC resonant converters are switched mode DC-DC power converters that are often used in higher power, high efficiency applications. The reason for this is that LLC converters offer high switching frequencies and lower switching losses. This makes them ideal for high power applications where efficiency is key, such as high quality PSU for gaming and PCs, and high power battery charging for applications such as electric vehicles. MPS currently offers several LLC controllers, the newest of which are the HR1210 family, which will be discussed during this presentation. Designers can choose any of these controllers depending on applications and cost performance requirements. Um, yes. After explaining the details of the LLC operation, we're going to discuss a real design case such as a 600 watt PSU with an efficiency above 90% and multiple outputs to serve different supply voltage levels for different loads. What makes LLC converters so attractive for such an application is that firstly, LLC converters are fully resonant and therefore produce less EMI. They also allow soft switching in both the primary and the secondary, uh, zero voltage switching in the MOSFETs and zero current switching in the diodes. The range at which they can produce this soft switching is um, very wide which means that this, this efficiency is not lost at light loads. And there's no inductor at the output, which means that all the inductors can be more easily integrated into a single magnetic structure, again, saving area and cost. And finally, because of their low losses, LLC converters are suitable for a wide range of applications up to very high power. So now let's move on to understanding how the LLC converter works. Well, the LLC converter is made up of four blocks. First, there's the power switches, which convert the input DC voltage into a high frequency square wave. They can be implemented either in a half bridge or a full bridge topology, depending on the application. And then we have a resonant tank, whose job is, is to filter the input square wave and eliminate the harmonics, outputting a sine wave of the fundamental frequency, which goes into the transformer. This is responsible for scaling the voltage down to an appropriate level through the scaling ratio N and isolating the input and the output of the converter. Then finally, we have the rectifier, which converts the reduced sine wave back into a DC signal for the output. The total gain of this circuit, therefore, is defined by the transformer and the resonant tank gain. Let's uh, go into the power switches. As I mentioned previously, the power switches can be implemented in a half bridge or a full bridge topology. And the main difference is that the full bridge topology generates a square wave with no DC offset. And the amplitude is the same as the input voltage whereas the half bridge topology emits a square wave that is offset by half the input voltage and has an amplitude of also half the input voltage, so half that of the full bridge wave. The diff another difference is that having few transistors, the half bridge is cheaper, but fewer transistors also means more current flowing through each of the transistors, which therefore increases conduction loss. The full bridge divides the current over more transistors, but the changes in voltage are higher, which results in increased switching losses. The resonant tank is made up of a capacitor and two inductors called the resonant inductor in series and the magnetizing inductor in parallel. Its role, as I said before, is filtering out the harmonics of the square wave. The tank's gain response is dependent on three main parameters. The load, which is expressed through the quality factor, Q. The normalized frequency, which is the ratio between the switching frequency of the MOSFETs and the tank's resonant frequency and the normalized inductance, which is defined as the relationship between the, re the resonant and magnetizing inductors. It's important to mention that these calculations have been made using the first harmonic analysis. 
This is applicable in this case because the resonant tank filters the uh, input square wave, only leaving the resonant frequency. And we use this to greatly simplify our equations. You may be asking yourself why there are two inductors in this converter. Well, this is understood by observing the tank's response to heavy and light loads, depending on the inductor present in the circuit. With only the series inductor, there's a clear resonant peak at the tank's resonant frequency for the heavy load. Whereas with the light load, uh, there is a much larger bandwidth. On the other hand, with only the magnetizing inductor, the heavy load does not peak and the light load has a large gain at the magnetizing resonant frequency. By joining both these inductors, what we get is a frequency response that will adequately respond to a much larger range of loads and will enable stable control for all operation conditions. So now let's go on to analyzing the three parameters, so the load, the frequency, and the inductor, and how they affect our converter's operation. To begin with, we'll focus on the gain. Now, as I said previously, the, gain, uh, the converter's gain is the addition of two blocks, the resonant tank and the transformer. Now, the resonant tank's gain is variable, depending on the load, the frequency, and the inductance, whereas the transformers is fixed and depends on the ratio between the primary and the secondary coils. Ideally, the tank should not amplify or dampen the signal. It should simply filter out the harmonics, and the transformer should be the only responsible element of changing the voltage level. Therefore, the nominal gain of our resonant tank should be 1. However, there are bound to be variations in the input voltage. And because the transformer's gain is fixed, in order to obtain a constant output voltage, the tank is going to have to compensate. Therefore, when the input voltage is below the nominal value, the tank will have to slightly amplify the signal, producing the maximum resonant tank gain. If the input voltage is above the nominal value, then the minimum gain will have to ensure that the voltage at the primary of the transformer remains at the nominal value. And this is called the minimum resonant gain. Now, next up is the load which is expressed through the quality factor. As the load increases, the peak gain of the resonant tank will be reduced. This means that we have to ensure that our worst case scenario, so where the load is at its highest, which we also call overload, uh, we have to make sure that in this case, the converter still meets the maximum gain requirement. The gain of the circuit is going to be controlled through the changes in the switching frequency of the MOSFETs. Looking at the graph, you can see that there are two distinct regions. On the right, we have the inductive region where zero voltage switching takes place. Now in this region, the relationship between gain and frequency tells us that if we reduce our frequency, then our gain is going to increase, as you can see. However, this only holds up to the peak gain frequency, after which we enter the, cap we enter the capacitive region, where reducing the frequency also reduces the gain. Therefore, we only want to work in the inductive region because this allows us for a stable gain control th throughout the entire frequency range. Also, entering the capacitive region could provoke shoot through currents, which could either damage the MOSFETs or at the very least have a very negative effect on efficiency. So as we mentioned before, different loads generate different frequency responses with different maximum gain frequencies. To establish our minimum switching frequency, we must consider the worst possible case, where the load is at its heaviest. So if the load is light, and we're in the inductive region, but if we change load suddenly, then we might find ourselves in the capacitive region, which we don't want to be in. So therefore, we have to increase our minimum frequency to where we stay in the inductive region for all loads. So then using this, uh, we can define our minimum frequency, and then we can define two uh, we can define two regions, a stable and an unstable region. Now, once we fix the minimum frequency, let's take a look at the frequency range that the converter can operate in. We first can establish an absolute maximum frequency, which is going to be defined by the maximum fre uh, switching frequency of the MOSFETs and the controllers. But the, operating win the frequency operating window needn't be this large. Instead, we can define it with our mi maximum and minimum gain that we established before, and therefore we can operate within this reduced switching frequency. Finally, let's talk about inductors. If we plot our gain response of an LLC tank for a series of loads, then we can obtain the following graph. Now, if we trace a line joining the maximum gain points of these curves, then we obtain the following curve. And if we plot the same curves for several values of uh, inductance, then we can see a set of curves starting to form that will lead us to the following graph. This graph shows us that for the same load, the difference between the maximum gain that the tank can reach depends on the value of the inductor. 
A smaller inductor value will provide higher gains for a wider range of loads, which will offer a wider range of operation. But on the other hand, a smaller inductor will also mean a higher magnetizing current and therefore a lower efficiency. So this is a, another trade-off to take into account. So what limits do we have for choosing our inductor? Well, we've got to consider, as, you, as usual, our worst case scenarios. First, we need to consider that the load is at its heaviest, so overload. And therefore, we have to make sure that we choose an inductor so that even with this heaviest load, we can still deliver enough gain to compensate for any shortcomings in the input voltage. So as you can see, designing an LLC converter is no easy task. There are many parameters that are all correlated and any design decisions that you take will affect the rest of parameters. So there are numerous trade-offs to take into account. So now I'm going to let Uriol tell you about some of the tools we've developed to help you in this design process. Okay, thank you, Tommy. To make the design process easier, MPS has developed a web-based tool that integrates all the calculation we have posed previously. This is a very useful because it allows the user to observe how modifying different parameters affect the design course. To better show you how the design tool works, we are going to use one of our reference designs, a 600 watts ATX power supply which has three different output voltage levels, 12, 5, and 3.3. This is the block diagram for this application. It includes a back-end PFC, which increases the power factor and step-ups the, vo the bus voltage. Then the LLC converter reduces the voltage down to 12 volts for the first output. And then two more back converters step down, down the voltage further to 3.3 and 5 volts. In parallel, a flyback converter delivers auxiliary supply to the board and five volts to the standby output. For now, we are going to focus on the LLC design, which is the topic of this webinar. This reference design is based on the HR1213, a combo controller which integrates the PFC and LLC control circuit together with the gate drivers. This device comes in different package. SOIC 20 for low cost applications and TSOP 20 for more compact ones. The regulation of PFC and LLC is based on digital control, which gives the converter added flexibility. The user can configure and monitor control parameters through UART communication interface. To make this even easier, we have created this graphical user interface where you can easily interact with the converter menu parameters. The first, the, the configuration menu, you can set up the converter general specifications. And second, in the monitor menu, you can observe real-time voltage and current values. So coming up to the tool, the first parameter to consider in our LLC design tool is the input voltage. The input of the LC converter comes from the boost PFC. Therefore, our nominal input will be 380 volts, but the voltage ripple can drive the input from 360 to 410 volts. The output voltage of the LC is going to be 12, and the current can rise up to 55 amps. This is taking into account both the 12 volts output and the input current for the two uh, DC to DC converters. Also, the tool allows us to configure an overload situation. For example, in this case, we use 10%. Now we can go to the tool available in our website and start designing our converter. Once we open the design tool, the first step is to make sure our input and output parameters are correct. To make this demonstration quicker, we have already placed the previously described values in the design. Once we begin the design process, the tool recommends us a value for the transformer tool ratio, but keep in mind that LLC peak gain can be adjusted with different parameters. Next, we have to choose a value for the normalized inductance and the quality factor from this course. 
which is at the same time the same that we saw in the presentation. Any point above the red line, which is the required max gain, will comply with the specifications. Once we select an operating point, a new grau graph will show the gain frequency response and also a recommended value for the resonant inductor and the capacitor. This is where the LLC tool becomes very useful because you can see how the converter response, uh, how the frequency response changes with the different values just by clicking on the graph. At this point, the recommended values are LN between four and eight and regarding the quality factor between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5. In our reference design, we have used LN equal to seven and Q equal to 0 0.5. Then you can modify the resonant inductor and capacitor values to fit with the normalized ones and observe how this affects the resonant frequency and the gain response. Finally, you can move the slider to select the operating frequency window, but remember that the minimum frequency is defined by the peak gain of the overload curve to make sure that the system stays in the inductive region. The maximum gain can be anywhere above the frequency of the minimum gain required. Then by pressing this button, you can observe the final results for your converter. Okay, so for the live demonstration of today, this is the board that we will be verifying. Below, we can see two, a two-stage common mode filter. This will help us to reduce both radiated and conducted emissions. At the top, we have the PFC, which will shape the input current as a sine wave in phase with the grid voltage. In this way, the power factor and the harmonic content is improved. At the right, we have the LLC stage with the resonant capacitor, resonant inductor, and the transformer configured in the tool. At the bottom, we have uh, the DC to DC board with the two back converters for five and 3.3 volts. This is the schematic of the LLC and highlighted are the spots that we are sensing in this, in this demonstration. In this way, we want to show you the soft switching effect of the half bridge structure. First, we have the switch node voltage, which is the input of the resonant tank. Secondly, we have the current flowing through the resonant capacitor. And finally, there is the gate source voltage for the low side MOSFET. So now we will uh, go into the lab and show you some, some waveforms. So uh, this is our MPS lab here in Barcelona. Uh, here we can help uh, clients to, to develop their products and also to analyze the reference design of, of MPS. Uh, in this case, today we have, uh, <clears throat> in this setup, we have an electronic load of 10 kilowatts. Uh, an AC power supply of two kilowatts and the oscilloscope where we will be uh, showing the, the waveforms. If we take a closer look, <clears throat> now the converter, uh, the, the AC power supply is plugged in. So the converter uh, starts start running, but since there is no load, the, the converter stays in, in what, what we call burst, burst mode burst mode, uh, uh, which consists in, <clears throat> in switching, in skipping pulses of the, of the switching uh, of the half bridge, the, the enough to maintain the output voltage. So in this case, if we start loading the converter, it starts switching properly. And if we configure the, our load, uh, for example, 25 amps, which, which will be almost a uh, half, half load, we can observe uh, the waveforms for the, 
as we mentioned before. So here we have the switch node, the gate voltage, and also the current flowing through the tank. And if we uh, go deeper on these signals, we can observe the, the uh, soft switching effect. When the, the switch node voltage becomes uh, zero before the controller uh, step up the gate voltage. So this is because the, the current is flowing um, in reverse, in reverse, uh, in the, uh, through the reverse uh, diode of the of the MOSFET. Yeah. Okay. So that's all we have time for today. Um, let's move on to the Q and A. So please ask if you have any questions, and we'll be happy to answer.